Welcome. Uh, my name is Craig Buchek, and I'm going to talk to you about Booleans today. Uh, if you want to follow along, I've got slides up here uh, in the lower right corner. You can get to it if you need to get to it later. Um, I do have some references and some more details, things I won't talk about in the presenter notes. You can just hit P to toggle those if you're playing along or playing along later. Uh, my Twitter is in the upper right corner if you want to tweet at me or about me. Um, I live in St. Louis, and that means I get to go to a conference called Strange Loop uh, without having to pay for any travel. Uh, and I went last year. Uh, it's a great conference. Uh, lots of things over your head there, though, uh, but it's really inspirational. Uh, my favorite talk was actually uh, the pre-conference day at ElmConf. Elm is a programming language that compiles down to JavaScript. Um, so I went to that. And it was a talk on Booleans by Jeremy Fairbank. And that talk actually inspired me to create this talk. Um, I thought, how is he going to talk 40 minutes about Booleans? Uh, turns out that's really hard. Um, my talk's probably going to be closer to 30 minutes than 40. Um, so that talk really inspired me. It was my favorite talk. And, uh, but Ruby's very different than Elm. So this talk is going to be quite a bit different than Jeremy's. But I'd recommend watching Jeremy's as well. Uh, so on to Ruby. Um, Booleans are pretty simple, right? Things are either true or false. Uh, true and false are instances of the true class and the false class. See there. Uh, in fact, there's really only one instance of each. No matter how we get the true, it's always the same object. Um, if you use the object ID method there, uh, you get 20 for all trues. Uh, all falses happen to be zero. Um, oddly, you can't create a new instance of these classes, which makes, kind of makes sense because if there's only one of them, you don't want to create a second one of each of those. So you get no method error on true class new or false class new. Uh, interestingly, there's no Boolean class in Ruby. You try to pull up Boolean and it doesn't know what that is. Um, if you look at true class, it has no ancestors that are Boolean, just object, kernel, and basic object, just Pretty much any object is going to have those same ancestors. Um, apparently, this is due to Ruby's small talk, small talk heritage. Um, I suppose it's because it's dynamically typed. Uh, you'd never have a reason to declare a variable as a Boolean. So anywhere Ruby expects a Boolean, you can actually use any object. Um, so you can basically, if you want to treat something true, you can pass one, two, three, or a new object. Um, there's only two things that are treated as false. Those are false and nil. You see the bottom two there. Uh, you might hear the, hear the terms truthy and falsy. Uh, they express something that Ruby will interpret as true or false in uh, a Boolean context. Um, you might come across those terms in RSpec test. Uh, expect one, two, three to be truthy. And you might expect something that returns false or, or uh, nil to be falsy. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that in if statements, though. Um, you're better off to use something idiomatic, um, something intention revealing that returns a Boolean. Here, uh, we're checking to see if the string is empty or blank, and if the variable is a nil. Um, this isn't really as big a problem in Ruby as in other languages. It's like Perl, PHP, uh, JavaScript interpret the empty string and zero is false. I think that leads to a lot of errors. I think that's probably the, the second largest programming language mistake ever made. Um, there's something called the billion dollar mistake uh, that uh, Tony Hoare made. Uh, he said he, when he introduced the null, null pointers, um, he thinks that led to over a billion dollars of, of damage to the industry. Um, so next we're going to talk about Booleans used as parameters in methods. Um, so I spend a lot of time in the Rails console or IRB or in Pry when I'm debugging some tests or whatever. Uh, often I'll want to see the class of an object. So you can just do object name dot class. And often I'll want to see what methods that object responds to. Um, I'll use a method that's on object name methods um, or a method that's on class name instance methods. And you can see I'm using the same, those two methods up there. Um, they return the same thing. Um, notice there's usually a return a long list of methods. Um, here they're running off the right side of the screen. Uh, show of hands, who's familiar with either of these, me these methods? 
All right, uh, those with your hands up, uh, do you know they take an optional parameter? Uh, a lot fewer, uh, like three, I think. And those of you who remain with your hands up, how many remember where you, whether you're supposed to pass true or false to not show the methods of the superclass? Uh, one hand left, all right. Uh, it happens to be false for these methods, um, but I can never remember that. I always have to look at the documentation, or more likely I just trial and error and see which one it, what it takes. Um, so to use it properly, you have to remember, do I pass it true or do I pass it false? So is there a way we could do better? Now, those are built-in methods, and so this is sort of just a, a theoretical thing. Uh, the best way to fix this API is to use a name parameter to describe the parameter. It'd be nice if I could just say, instead of methods false, I could say methods superclass methods false to not show the superclass methods. Um, but this, this method predates name parameters in Ruby, and we need to keep backwards compatibility. Um, so in older Ruby versions, we used to have to use an options hash to emulate name parameters. And since we want this to be backwards compatible, I would still have to do that. Um, also, to take either a bare Boolean or a hash would have to use this method. So I actually wrote a replacement methods method um, that gives us the option to either use the old way, passing false, or to use that named superclass methods uh, option. Uh, maybe I'll sub submit that to the uh, Ruby core team. Um, but ideally, it'd probably be better just to have two separate methods, one called methods that gives you just the immediate methods and one called all methods that gives you everything. So how would you describe how that, what that original method does? Um, I would say that it shows the methods defined for this object or the methods only defined by its immediate class. Anytime you have an or in a description of a method or class, that's a code smell and you're probably violating the single responsibility principle. Um, came across this example from Rails uh, when, a couple months ago when I was upgrading to Rails 5. Um, so these both do the same thing. Uh, the first one was the original Rails API. I don't know how far back it goes. So user is an object and it has an association called things. Normally you just say user.things and it will give you all the things that, that user owns. Um, but if you want it to reload, you pass true to things. Um, second is the current API, user.things.reload. It's more explicit. Um, again, you, what does that true mean there? Uh, the original API was deprecated as of Rails 5 and removed as of Rails 5.1. Uh, so not only is the new one clear, but the old way can lead to some very subtle bugs. So I found this bug. Um, this is Rails issue 26,413. I actually have a link to that if you want to check it out. So the bug report complains that the sales are being reloaded. And he's like, why are the sales being reloaded here? Um, anyone see the issue here? All right, so the problem is that the sales association doesn't actually take a hash. It takes a Boolean like the previous screen. So the true there. Um, so as I said before, anything besides nil and false are treated as true. So that limit 10 which desugars to a hash is interpreted as, as true. So it's just client sales true. And so it's reloading the sales and it's not doing any limiting. Um, you'd have to do sales dot limit uh, parentheses 10 to get it to work. Or maybe you could do where. Uh, I don't think you can do a where with the limit. So very subtle. You, know, you can't really see why that's a bug. So I want to take a short detour here to, call, to talk about something called connaissance. Uh, connaissance was a word uh, that existed before computers were around. Uh, these are some definitions from Webster's Dictionary as far back as 1913. Uh, connaissance means common birth or production of multiple things at the same time or the act of growing together. So 1992, uh, a person named May Lear Page Jones brought this idea to the object-oriented programming community. Um, first, it was in a paper comparing techniques by means of encapsulation and connaissance. Uh, then he wrote a good book, or a book that I've heard is pretty good. I'm going to pick it up sometime. Uh, 1996, what every programmer should know about object-oriented design. 
And then he had a follow-up uh, when UML was all the rage in 1999, Fundamentals of Object-Oriented Design in UML. So he talked about Kinesins. Um, I've got links to those in the presentation notes, including the full text of the original article from the ACM. Uh, there's a couple other sites. Kinesins.io is pretty good about explaining this pretty well, too. So here's uh, May Lear's definition of Kinesins. Uh, it's a measurement of the amount of coupling or dependencies among, dependence, uh, among components within a software system. And in particular, he's talking about an object-oriented system. So 2009, Jim Wyrick uh, brought this idea of Kinesins to the Ruby community. Unfortunately, Jim passed away a few years ago. Uh, he is definitely missed at conferences. So here's roughly Jim's uh, definition of Kinesins. Two pieces of code share Kinesins when changing one requires a corresponding change to the other. And if you have excessive Kinesins, it means the system's hard to change and hard to maintain. Um, so Jim gave a few different talks on this. The first one was called The Grand Unified Theory of Software Design. Um, he had a, uh, an example very similar to, the, to my methods example. Uh, and in 2012, he had a newer talk called Kinesins Examined. Um, so Jim made the argument that Kinesins underlines many of the other rules of good object-oriented design, like dry and code smells and race conditions. So we want to reduce Kinesins like we want to reduce coupling. Here's a list of different types of Kinesins. Um, they're ordered from weakest to strongest, so we should prefer the ones towards the top. These are the static Kinesins types. There's some dynamic types as well, um, but they're all stronger than these, so you'd prefer to use the static versus the dynamic. So I'll go through each of these. Um, Kinesins of name means agreeing on the name of something in two different parts of your code. So an example, anytime we call a method, the method name that we use to call it has to be the same as the method name that we use to define it. And it's the same with any variable or constant. When we reference it, it has to be the same name. That's pretty common, right? Uh, Kinesins of type is agreement on the type of something. Now, we don't have static types in Ruby. We have what's called duck typing, which means does it, does it quack like a duck? If it quacks like a duck, then, it, then it's acting like a duck. It's close enough. Um, Kinesins of meaning. Uh, is agreement on the meaning of the interpretation of spe specific values, like true or false. Um, Kinesins of position is agreement on the order of values, like if you have a method that takes three arguments, uh, the order that you specify them is, is important. Um, although if you use name parameters, we go up to uh, Kinesins of name. So according to this, you should always use name parameters. I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm actually thinking about that. Uh, Kinesins of algorithms is probably one of the more interesting ones on this list. Um, agreeing on a particular algorithm. And the two examples that I came up with are encoding and decoding passwords. Um, you have to have, you know, if you've got two different apps using the same database with encoded passwords, you have to use the same algorithm. Uh, the other one is credit card numbers. There's a checksum to make sure that your credit card number is a, is a valid credit card number. And so you might have client-side code. Uh, server-side code, and then a service that all have to run that same algorithm to run checksum on the card number. So remember, we always want to reduce Kinesins. If we can replace a stronger form with a weaker form, we've reduced Kinesins. Um, one way to do that is increase locality. Um, so if you've got two things in the same file that have the same name or the same meaning, it's easier to understand than if it's in a different file or in a different program, like that credit card example. They're on different computers written in different programming languages. So note that connaissance of name is weaker than connaissance of meaning. And that's what we did here. We replaced a Boolean parameter with a specific meaning with a name parameter. And that specific meaning is, is difficult to remember. And we, we reduce connaissance by replacing connaissance of meaning with connaissance of name. So next, I want to talk about Booleans used to represent application state. That's a picture of the Balkan states, by the way. Uh, let's say we have an editor class, and it has several Booleans representing possible states. Uh, we might need to tra keep track of whether the user is editing, uh, if the file is being saved, or if there's an error condition. Uh, anyone see a problem with this class? 
All right, the problem is we can end up in a combination of states that make no sense. What do it mean to be both editing and saving? Well, if the error is true, then do the other fields actually make any sense? We should try to ensure our code can never get into an impossible state. Um, there's a great talk by Richard Feldman. Again, it's in Elm, but it's probably still worth watching, called Making Impossible States Impossible. So how can we improve on that? Um, we should use a, a single field to represent the state. This doesn't look like a big improvement. We still have the case statement there. But it does prevent us from ever getting in a state that's meaningless or invalid and ensures the options in, what's our, in our case statement, the order of those options doesn't really matter in a case statement. We can do better than that, though. Uh, active record enum uh, is something that was added, I think, Rails 4, maybe 5. I don't know, I think it was 4. Um, to define possible states. Uh, this allows us to catch bugs easier because Ruby will catch an in incorrect method name easy, more easily than a mistyped symbol or string. Um, if you see here, we've got uh, state.editing question mark. So any of the uh, states that we define up there, editing, saving, and error, uh, we get methods with question marks in there that we can just check them. Um, there's several state machine gems. We could implement our own um, to create a state object. Uh, the gems usually have some other nice features that are helpful. Um, although the, the enum is pretty nice, uh, it came out after the state gems. If you can use, use enum, I would, I would recommend that first and then uh, look into some of the state machine gems. Um, the state class is pretty similar to the enum here in this example, except if we have a, su a sufficiently specialized state class, uh, maybe we can just delegate to the object itself and have uh, it render. So, you know, a state could do the render for us. The original version of that code contains a code smell called primitive obsession. Um, it's using a primitive type when a uh, more specialized type would be more appropriate. Usually that's going to be a class in Ruby, of course. So one example is using, using floating point numbers to represent money. Uh, another is using a string to represent a URL. Um, if you think about it, a URL has more than just a string of text. It actually has pieces. Um, you know, it has the, the name of the web server. It has a path. It's got fragments. It's got a query string. Um, so using a string isn't always the best idea there. So in Ruby, we're, we're apt to actually abuse strings in this way. It's often called stringly type to play on words from strongly type from other languages. Um, but this is an example where we overuse Booleans. Um, this version still has primitive obsession. Uh, we just replace Boolean primitives with symbol primitives. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about Boolean fields. Um, we've got a Boolean attribute here uh, to keep track of whether the object has been deleted. Uh, I used a little tool there I wrote called uh, Virtus Active Record so I can tell, show you in the code uh, what attributes the model has. So we've got a deleted field that's a Boolean. And, you know, it just says, has this been deleted? We can have a, uh, a query to show just not deleted users. Um, so my suggestion, instead of marking something as deleted with a Boolean, we can mark when it was deleted. This turns out to be pretty useful in the end. Um, and we might want to keep track of who and when it was deleted. Um, auditing, you probably want to know who did things and when they did them. All right, next we'll talk about uh, exponential complexity with Booleans. Let's say we have a method to render the document taking each of those three Boolean options again. Uh, but this time, let's say the states are actually independent of each other and we can't combine them. Um, so how many cases would we have to handle uh, if this met method takes three Booleans there? It's going to take eight. So eight cases for three independent Boolean variables. If you're lucky, you'll get to write it like this. If you're unlucky, it's going to look more like that. Uh, that's a method with 29 lines of code. Too big to fit on the screen here. Uh, that's without doing anything interesting. You know, we're just calling another method for each case. Uh, don't forget the 
eight test cases you're going to need. More likely than not, you're probably going to forget one. And you're not going to have any protection, really, from, from forgetting it. Um, so the formula for the number of conditions is 2 to the power of n if you have n independent Boolean variables. That's exponential growth of the bad kind. So our solution here, again, is to represent the state with a single variable, uh, just passing the state. Now we only have to handle one case for each possible state. Now we're down to three or four cases, four if you want to handle the, the, the missing case, uh, and a similar number of tests. So let's move on to Boolean operations and Boolean algebra. This won't be too bad. Uh, let's start out pretty simple. Um, so there's this little square corner sign that's the Boolean algebra symbol for not. In Ruby, we use the exclamation point, uh, frequently called bang in Ruby. Uh, I think that came from Perl, perhaps. Um, sometimes you'll see a squiggle or a tilde. Uh, and a lot of times in mathematical notation or uh, I guess sort of electronics notation, you'll see an overline. Uh, a line over a variable or uh, whatever is being used to represent the, uh, the, the Boolean value. Um, note that Ruby does have a, the tilde operator, but that's for, uh, it's really what you want. It's used for binaries, not for Booleans. Um, so, you know, not false is true and not true is false. Um, so this is called the truth table. This is one for negation. Uh, so if you've got x of 0, then not x is 1, and vice versa. Um, so we often think of true and false as 1 and 0, or on and off. It comes from electronics. In fact, electronics has their own symbols for this. So that's the not symbol. The important part is actually the circle there on the right side. Um, so that says whatever input uh, comes in on A, uh, the opposite output will go out on Q. So... The AND, the fancy word for AND is conjunction. Um, in Boolean algebra, uh, it's like a caret symbol uh, or an inverted V. Uh, that's called the conjunction symbol. Um, if you remember uh, sets, intersection is upside down U. Um, kind of the same thing. Uh, the intersection is uh, things that can contain uh, items from one set and the other set. So there's actually a, a, a symmetry between uh, sets and uh, booleans. Um, in Ruby, we use ampersand ampersand. Um, you may see multiplication signs. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, Ruby also has a single ampersand for, again, that's for binary and. And there's also the and keyword, but you probably don't want to use it because it has a different precedence. Um, if you use RuboCop, it pretty much tells you never to use it. So stay away from that unless you really know what you're doing. So here's the truth table for AND. Um, on that last slide, I showed that multiplication sign is an alternative notation. If you look at that, if you treat them as zeros and ones, you multiply them, and you get the answer there for, for the AND. I did not know that. Uh, here for uh, electronics is the logic gate for AND. Uh, the fancy word for OR is disjunction. Um, so Boolean algebra, that V-like symbol is called the disjunction symbol. Again, like sets, it looks very much like the union symbol. Uh, and union is something, is about elements belonging to one set or the other. Um, in Ruby, we use the two vertical bars. Um, we also, again, we also have the single bar for binary, and we have the OR keyword, but rarely do you want to use either one of those. Uh, sometimes you'll see a plus sign. So there's some of the options using uh, Ruby, double vertical bars. Um, here is the uh, truth table. Um, so again, addition, if you just put a plus sign between those two, uh, the first three makes sense. And the last one, 1 plus 1 is 1? Well, there's no 2s in binary. So I, I think you just have to memorize that one. Uh, an OR gate in logic symbols or uh, digital logic. A couple other operators you might run into, exclusive or, I rarely have seen that symbol. Uh, I haven't really seen the symbols for the other two either. Um, 
there's actually 16 possible operators of two Boolean operands. But most of them aren't very interesting, like the one that always returns true. Um, there's a set of laws that govern transforming Boolean expressions. Uh, a friend of mine came across something like this once, and he submitted a pull request to make it clear. So we've got a predicate method. Um, a predicate method just means a method that returns true or false. It's based on two other predicate methods here. Um, having that explicit true or an explicit false is kind of a smell to me, um, with the possible exception if you've got a guard clause that's returning true or false early in a predicate method. Um, we're going to need some tools to refactor that to make it more readable. Um, so here's the way, some of the ways you can transform Boolean expressions. We can use these to, to refactor or simplify our code. Uh, note these come in pairs, one for and and one for or. It's a lot of transformations for just two possible values and three operators, right? Um, there's actually more than that. Um, one other thing I want to point out, Ruby has shortcutting, which means that different code might run depending on which is on the right and which is on the left, but the, but the value you'll get back will be the same either way. So I want to call one of those out in particular called De Morgan's Law. Um, this basically shows you can switch and and or by adding knots. Uh, if you see there in the top one. Um, the second set there is just the first set with the side switched and the knots moved to the other side. So really, we only need not and either and and or, and we can replace one with the other if we need to. Um, we can rewrite the third operation in terms of the other two. Um, for clarity's sake, I would encourage you not to do that in most cases. Um, electronics actually goes further and they only have a component called the NAND gate, which does an, an AND NOT. Um, for a NOT, they just use a single input uh, that goes into both inputs and it, it just NOTs it. Um, but for our purposes, we can use the Morgan's Law to clarify our code. Uh, one other transformation is taking an IF THEN ELSE and um, converting it to use Boolean operators. Um, I had to look that one up and check it out and make sure I got it right. So basically, if you, if you read the right side, it, it reads pretty close to the same. So if x and y, you know, x then do y, and if that's not true, then check x again and otherwise do z. So now that we've got the prepper tools, let's get to work. Uh, that explicit truth sticks out to me. Uh, but it's easier to get rid of the if first. And I wrote the rule down there that we're going to use. So we apply that rule, and we got rid of the if statement. Now we've got some duplication there. As Sandy Metz says, sometimes it's, you need to take a step back to get to where you're headed. Um, so we can use the identity law now to get rid of that explicit true on the right side. Uh, now we can use distributor law to put those two together or to put the two approvers enabled next to each other. Now we have what's called a tautology. X or not X, that's always going to be true, right? Um, so we're going to get rid of the second line there, line three. That's going to be true. We can get rid of true with the identity law again. Anything and true is that same thing. Uh, so now we've got just two terms, and we can go one of two ways at this point. We could apply De Morgan's Law, um, but I don't think that's any easier to read than the last one. Um, I would actually go with this to refra refactor to extract some methods to make things more clear. Um, so don't be afraid to extract a method even if it's just one line and even if you're adding just a not, if it's going to make things more clear. Uh, even if they're used in just that one place. Uh, note that I did a lot of small steps there, right? And typically, I do more than one step at a time. But man, you really want to have tests so that you don't mess things up. Oh, uh, what did I just hit? Oh, OK. Um, all right, so the question is, which of these would you rather come across? Which is easier to figure out the meaning of? I would say the second one is easier to read, easier to understand, easier to change than the first one. So what's the point of this? 
the original code that we looked at all worked. Um, so why would we change it? Um, we read code a lot more than we write it, so we should optimize for reading. And more importantly, we should optimize for understanding. Abstractions are meant to, to help us understand things. As Sandy Metz says, take the time to find the right abstraction. Sometimes that'll take some extra work. Writing good code will take longer in the short run, but in the long run it'll pay off. So I hope that I've shown that there's more to the Booleans than meets the eye. Uh, but the bigger point is we can make our code easier to read and understand. So take a little time to make it easier for the next person who has to read your code. More often than not, that'll be you. And even if it's not, it's the right thing to help your teammates out. So thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to Jeremy Fairbank for inspiring this talk. Uh, Amos King, who provided uh, some of the examples. Uh, my local user group in St. Louis. Uh, my team at F5 and RailsConf for choosing my talk. And thank you to my employer, F5, who sponsored my travel. Uh, we do have a few positions open for web developers. If you're interested, you can come see me. Um, so a co coworker told me this joke, and it's the only joke I could find about Booleans. <laughs> Best thing about a Boolean is even if you're wrong, you're only off by a bit. <laughs> I don't know if that's that funny. Um, so um, one reason I give talks at conferences is to start conversations. Uh, please don't hesitate to come and talk to me. Um, and uh, you can find the slides there, the source. I used a tool called Remark to create these slides in HTML. Uh, you can tweet at me, check out my GitHub, uh, check out the presentations on GitHub, or send me an email. Thanks for your time.